Research is very important to conductive education because very little empirical research exists. Without empirical research, insurance companies are not willing to pay for therapy, and the medical community doesn't really embrace the therapy for its full value. So the Coleman Foundation granted us money to build a research lab at the Center for Independence. It is integrated right into a classroom, so for the children, it is non-obtrusive to their programming. This also allows the children to be data captured, if you would, in a familiar environment, so they're not afraid and they're not scared of novel personnel. In working with the staff, there were three areas that we wanted to measure improvement in the children. If the children had better hand-to-mouth skills, if the children had better ambulation and walking patterns, and if the children had a faster ability to go from sitting in a chair to standing up, that that would be some markers of improvement in functional independence. Now you might think to yourself, why is this important? Well, this is important if you're trying to get out of your chair in a classroom, if you're trying to get away from the cafeteria table in the cafeteria, all of these things are on timed um, intervals. And if you take too long to do that, then your peers leave you behind. So in the sit-stand data that we're going to present, we looked at children and just how long it took them to go from a sitting position to a standing position. A typical four-year-old can do this in one second to get their knee completely straight. So in the child that we looked at when she began conductive education, it took her five seconds to go from a sitting position to a standing position with her knee fully extended. After seven months of conductive education, she was able to do this exact same movement in 2.5 seconds. So this means that she can get out of her chair in the classroom and over to the board in half the time. And this improves her quality of life because now she can be a more integral part of her classroom and participate more freely. Similarly, in the cafeteria or on the playground, she can keep up with her peers and participate at a more age-appropriate level. The second skill we looked at was hand-to-mouth. Now, you might ask yourself, why is hand-to-mouth important in a child or in an adult? Hand-to-mouth is very important if you think about the trajectory of the spoon, how fast the spoon is moving, and if you can keep food on your spoon or fork. And a lot of children with cerebral palsy, they move the spoon very ballistically with great force. So unless the food is very secured on the spoon or fork, it goes flying. Um, similarly, they may move the spoon all over the place. And so the trajectory from the table to their mouth actually is a very wide pattern. This could be annoying to the person sitting next to you in the cafeteria, or again, your food could go flying. And so I could sort of call this segment putting to peace. When the children first started in conductive education, they had a very wide trajectory. So the spoon was traveling all over space. And um, that would mean that the food could go flying. And you'd really have to eat something the consistency of pudding or peanut butter in order to keep it on your spoon. At the end of seven months of therapy, what we see is the trajectory of the spoon is a lot smoother. So they're very much going from the food source up to their mouth without a lot of extra movement, and they're also moving at a slower pace. So the velocity of the spoon has decreased significantly. This also means that food isn't flying off the spoon, and you could actually sit next to a child in a restaurant in the cafeteria and not be splattered with their food. In our culture, eating is a very social activity, and if you cannot participate in a meal with your family or with your friends, you once again can't participate in a very lively part of your life and a very important part of a child development. And so this shows us that conductive education through that motor learning and some training can really help children become more functional, they can be more socially appropriate, and they can again be better members of society. The third area that we looked at was walking. And walking is very important for children because they like to get around. In our society, we can if you can't walk, we can always provide you with a wheelchair, but that has implications as well. Socially, now you have a piece of equipment. The other thing is, is that you're not standing and walking, so your bones aren't getting good input and they're not getting strong. And so what we see with adults who have used a wheelchair for many years, um, young adults who have used a wheelchair for many years, is that they have osteoporosis and they have severe bone deformity and decreased strength. So we want to keep all of those things by keeping these children walking, but walking in a good pattern. 
And so what our data showed us was that children, when they first started to walk, needed a lot of assistance. And if you think about the pelvis being the middle, when you're walking, your pelvis stays pretty level and pretty even. With children with cerebral palsy, when they walk, their pelvis just swings side to side, which puts a lot of strain on their back, a lot of strain on their knees. And over time, if you walk with this pattern for 10 to 15 years, you develop significant back pain, significant knee and foot pain, significant foot deformities. So what we're thinking now is, is that a child, after a year and a bit of conductive education and improved gait pattern, has decreased energy use, and so they have more energy to use in important things like school, socializing with their friends, um, just being part of their family. They also have better alignment issues. So over the long term, we would expect that their knee pain, back pain, and deformities in those areas would also decrease. Um, overall, what we saw in empirical data is that we have actually seen a nice improvement in a child's skills and the way they move. Um, this is the first of this kind of research that has gone on in the United States. What we'd like to do in the future is continue collecting data and really comparing these children who are in conductive education to children with cerebral palsy who don't get conductive education. Because we assume those children also show gains and improvements, but we'd like to see who showed more improvements. The nice thing about using the camera system is that it's very objective. You just can't argue with the computers and you can't argue with the sensors. And so there's no room for subjectivity. And this is very nice because it's very objective and the empirical data can then be easily reported to the scientific community without a lot of room for um, arguing subjectivity. So again, I'd like to thank the Coleman Foundation for supporting this research and hope in the future that we will continue to support this research so we can show empirical gains across um, all areas of life in using conductive education as our model. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Herbst and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Independence for Conductive Education. I want to start out today firstly by saying thank you to everyone at the Coleman Foundation. The support that we've received both financially and professionally and through